You're listening to the Attempt Adventure Podcast, a podcast all about finding adventure every day and making life more interesting. From Bangkok, Thailand, I'm Michael DeRosiers, joined as always by my co-host, James Barrett from Dallas, Texas, soon to be Boulder, Colorado. Nice. Now, when is the move? Mm, August. We are moving Ooh, in August. That is, it is, a, that is, it is official official. That is very soon. Have you found a place yet? Not yet. We're we're going up there in a couple of weeks and okay. going to find something and get the ball rolling. Have you ever read The Stand by Stephen King? I have not. Mm. Okay, a good a good portion of it takes place in Boulder. That's where the good mm. guys go. Okay, I mean that's it is where the good guys are. Bad guys go to Las Vegas. That is fair. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's cool, cool town. I've only been through it. I've never actually spent much time there. Um, it's cool. As we talked like about it. in that last episode, where I told you how disastrous my attempted trip to Boulder went, <laughs> never got, never, <laughs> never ended up there. So I will certainly be coming to visit. Yes, you will. It'll be great. Well, that's exciting. Very cool. I'm glad to hear that. I think you guys will really enjoy it there. I do too. All right. Well, James, did you do anything new or adventurous this week? I did. I went and saw my brother, and we actually drove around trying to find our favorite spots Oh, good! in town. Cool. So sort of going in with the theme of things. I have some ideas. I've been to some places I've never been before, so that's been, that was a lot of fun. Very cool. So, so yeah, I did. No penalty nice. for me this week. Very good. What about, what about you? Did you, did you make your, um, what, Belgian food, I believe? So I found, yes, I found a recipe for chicken waterzui, or waterzui. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a chicken stew, very hearty. Um, yeah, it was good. There's there's not um, not a lot, really. I mean, I'm sure there is a lot, but there's not a lot that you can find on the internet if you look up Belgian food. It's not like they're, they're famous for their chocolate, but they're not really famous for, like, their mm-hmm. cuisine, necessarily. Um, and I've never been yeah. to Belgium. Like um, my fiance fries. has, yeah, that's what she said. She said that when she was there, the thing that was so outstanding was that you order French fries and you get like 20 different sauces to dip them in, which sounds fun, <laughs> but I've never been, um, it's like a creamy chicken stew. So yeah, we'll definitely take pictures of that sounds good. and put that up was on the, uh, on the website. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Very kind of filling and, and, um, hearty. A lot of veggies. Good stuff. It's funny how stew works in different parts of the world. How so? So stew in, you know, in North America at least, is very much like a winter thing. You don't really eat soup and stew when it's summertime. But in Asia, it's all the time food. And it's interesting to me because the last thing I want when it's like 100 degrees outside is a hot bowl of soup. (laughs) (laughs) Especially a spicy one, right? I know. But that's like a thing, in, especially like in Thailand, is spicy soup. And it's delicious. Mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily what I want when yeah. it's 95 degrees with 100% humidity. There's my stew rant. Um, I guess I've gotten used to it, but yeah, that's true. So, uh, yeah, so I did that. And uh, it was good. So I don't have uh, another penalty. Now, I know there's no double jeopardy in this, but I did something else as well. Oh, yeah. uh, on... Monday, I attended, well, it was your Monday, it was my Tuesday morning. I don't know how long he's been doing it, but during COVID times, Rick Steves from PBS Rick Steves Travel and Rick Steves Travel Guides has been hosting these Zoom online um, Monday night travel with Rick Steves. And so you can join them live, and if you miss them live, you can just watch them, which is what I did because it was at an odd time for me. But I watched his recent one, which is about the coolest or his favorite like natural wonders in Europe. And it was really neat. Like he talked about the, the moors of Scotland and like the, the Matterhorn and like, he just, he just had like a glass of wine and some, you know, it was just like a big zoom call and he was just talking about his favorite places in Europe and it was really fun. So I attended that and I, that was kind of adventurous, but virtual. I don't, I'm not very familiar with Europe. I've not really mm-hmm. traveled there. Not extensively. So I did that. So I had a little, little mini adventure, virtual adventure, you can say. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I like that. Um, well, why don't we give a little reminder for the new challenge? Yeah. So the challenge this month is 
to find your favorite local spot, whether that be I mean, just anything, any place in your area that is your favorite. A donut shop? Yeah, it could be. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to judge. An old bridge? Yeah. I mean, you spent s- several years of your life in Waco, where one of the big attractions is an old bridge. Yeah, it was the first suspension bridge, or at least the oldest suspension yeah. bridge. We used to go tortilla tossing. We would we would buy tortillas and throw them off the bridge. This was back in the day before Waco had anything to do. Before, yeah, before the the Gaines family rolled into town. Now, I know now now it's got stuff and it's weird. I don't like it anymore. No, well, I mean, there's something to be said for it because back in the day, if you ever said you were from Waco, the only thing that would that would come up in people's minds was uh, David Koresh. And mm, it's more pleasant to be associated with Chip and Joanna Gaines than it is to be associated with uh, with the Branch Davidians, to be fair. That's fair. No, that's a good point. That so, is a good point. <laughs> yeah. So we used to go tortilla tossing off that bridge. I don't know if the bridge was one of my favorite places in Waco. I really liked Cameron Park. You and Cameron I Park is nice. playing yeah. frisbee golf there with my roommates a couple times. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. But anyway... <laughs> Yeah, so find your favorite spot in your area, take a picture of it, send it to us. Yeah. And again, just like last month, the the three top will receive a little prize. That's right. As our thank you to you for participating. And you can mm-hmm. share them to us on Instagram, hashtag AttemptAdventure, or just email them to us. Hello at AttemptAdventure.com. Either way works. Subject line, monthly challenge. Okay, well, guys, we have another very cool interview for you today. This week, we invited Robert Massey from Robert Massey Photography and the Travel and Adventure Photography School podcast onto the show to talk about outdoor adventure, being an adventure photographer, and some of his adventures that he's been on in the wilds of Alberta, Canada. So without further ado, let's go on to the interview. All right, welcome back to Attempt Adventure, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. I'm joined by Robert Massey from the Travel and Adventure Photography School podcast. Hey man, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. The more people we can get adventuring, the better this world is going to be. Ah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Well, I'm super glad you're here. So to start us off, why don't you just tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are, and what you do? Awesome. So my name is Robert. I am a photographer, podcaster, content creator type person in Calgary, Alberta, which is in Canada, like an hour and a half outside Banff National Park, which is what most people know Calgary for. It's the airport to get to Banff. Right. And that's (laughs) such a great place to live if you're into outdoor adventure. Yeah, this is the perfect place to be. I'm going to be moving out to Banff sometime over the course of the summer or like that area, which is just going to be spectacular and amazing and the best place in the world to be. So I'm super stoked to be out there. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, and I know from your podcast, I know you're into a lot of hiking and like outdoor exploration. And um, I don't know, what, what kind of outdoor adventures are you into? Is it mostly like hiking type stuff or, or what kind of things do you do generally? It's a lot of hiking. It's a lot of like backcountry exploration, things like that. I'm getting into a lot more backpacking with like camera equipment going on, which is a lot more work than just going backpacking because you got an extra 15 pounds of kit to take with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, like lots of water activities. I love canoeing, kayaking, water skiing, anything like that. That's just going to get me outdoors and spending time outside. So yeah. super cool. Well, I, I think that's awesome. You know, I'm living here in Bangkok, Thailand right now, and obviously there's a lot of adventure here, but a lot of it's urban adventure. You know, I don't have a car and without a car, it's quite difficult to get out into the wilderness here. There are some incredible national parks, uh, but they're just a little bit difficult. So I think it's super cool if you can live somewhere where you're just able to just walk out your door basically and and go off and and hike and climb a mountain i know some of your podcasts you say oh yeah i just i went out for a a morning hike up a mountain and you know it's like something you could just (laughs) do easily and i think that's super cool and that's something that's so awesome about living i think in that part of the world yeah i'm super super lucky to be here like calgary is situated at the center of the mountains being an hour behind us 
the Badlands are an hour to the east. We've got like a desert, a literal desert, like four or five hours away, just a little bit south. It's a spectacular place to be if you want to explore a little bit of everything. I think we're missing the ocean. That's really it. Right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, there's not much, unless I guess unless you're going underwater, I guess there's not so much to photograph of just... <laughs> of just ocean. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. That's great. Well, tell me a little bit about your history with outdoor adventure. How did you get into it? And how did you get into outdoor photography? Uh, yeah, so I started in photography as a photojournalist, actually. So I was trained to do media journalism. Um, and that was spectacular and amazing and interesting. And while I was in the midst of that, obviously outside covering a lot of events, doing things like that. And then my brother-in-law, um, and I guess or my sister and my brother-in-law got married. Mm-hmm and spent a lot more time with him. And he's a huge outdoors advocate. And I'm like, oh, this is great. And just kind of started doing more and more stuff with him. And that would have been back in about 2012, roughly, and just kind of exploded out of there, 2011, something like that. And now I'm spending all my time outdoors, which is just brilliant. And I, I love it because I grew up outside camping and hanging out in the mountains and traveling a ton with my family. And then I kind of fell out of it when I became a journalist because you have no time on your hands. You work 80 to 90 I'm hours sure, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, oh, okay. And then when I left the journalism sphere and started working a little bit more on photography and doing work with not-for-profits, they, the, I had more time on my hands. I'm like, I'm going to spend this outside. I don't want to sit inside an office anymore. I'm going to be out there and take photographs. So so what are some of your favorite subjects to photograph? Um, I love capturing the emotion of something going on. So whether that's the emotion of a landscape, which is okay. My landscape photography admittedly is not as good as what I'd like it to be. Um, I look at people like Paul Ziska and Chris Picard and some of those other adventure photographers, and they do amazing things where you can actually feel the emotion of the landscape come out of it. And that's what I'm working towards. Um, but I'm really, what I really focus on in that moment is the human aspect whenever you can include it in there. So somebody who would say like putting a little person in a giant landscape is super interesting because it gives you perspective. I guess it just really magnifies it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So like having like this little person sitting beside like a huge waterfall, you're like, oh, that waterfall. Okay. I get that. Even if that person is only five feet tall, like, (laughs) yeah. So I love the human element being added into these massive landscapes that we've got. And so I guess that's where your, um, your portrait business came from, right? Your adventure portraits. I'd like to hear more about that as well. What kind of adventures do you go on with people? I'm sure it's got to be pretty fascinating. I'm sure you've probably been on some interesting adventures trying to get these portraits of your clients. Yeah, so there's been some pretty fun experiences out there. I think one of the first ones we ever did where I realized this is something we could do was I was actually out rock climbing with some friends and just kind of shooting alongside rock climbing with them. And I'm like hanging out on the wall, taking some photos of them down off to the other side of me. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, this is the best thing you'd ever do. And it combines this human element of adventure and exploration with something people can identify with and with a memory that people want to keep. Because it's really hard to document yourself in the midst of an adventure and still experience the adventure. Right. Like, I can set up a tripod and walk another hundred feet away and take a photo of myself and go back and forth and do this, but then I'm out of that adventure entirely. So this is a chance for somebody to be a part of an adventure and not even have to worry about getting these amazing photos of themselves in this beautiful place. Right. And yeah. Cause that takes a, a ton of time, a ton of effort, a ton of equipment. And like you yep. said, you're not really living in the moment. And I think that there's something really cool about that. I mean, a photograph or a portrait in a studio can look really nice, but it's very posed, you know, whereas if you're actually, I don't know, climbing a mountain. I mean, you're actually climbing a mountain. Even if you're posing on the mountain, you're actually doing it. You know, it's still, you're still really doing that. Yeah. And that's one of the things people really love about it. It's like, oh, I can actually go and explore and do this. And like, we'll be outside. It's like, yeah, like why waste our time indoors if we could be outside creating something amazing together? Right. So, so how does this work? Do they come to you and say, hey, I want to go and go to this, this national park and do this? Or do you like suggest, hey, let's go here and let's, canoe or how does that work how does the planning work for that uh so it kind of works a little bit of both so i've had some people come up and go hey like we're gonna go out rock climbing like can you come out and do this with us it's like yeah okay that's within my capabilities we can definitely do that because there are definitely climbs where i'm like nope that is outside my skill set we got to find you somebody different (laughs) okay Um, right right but of course like when that's outside my skill set i'm going to help them find somebody who can help them document it because i still want their document adventure to be documented Um, So yeah, so some people will do that. Sometimes they'll come and go like, I just want some photos outdoors and then we'll talk about it. We'll pass back and forth. Like what's important to you. So I actually Mm -hmm. just did an urban shoot with somebody that's, it's still an adventure outdoors portrait, but it's here in the city because they, they aren't a mountainy out like Elon lakes and things like that kind of person, but they love just exploring the town that they've grown up in. So it really depends on what that person is looking for. And then I help them decide 
at that point what they want to do, where they want to go. I've got a pretty good idea of all the national parks and all that kind of stuff that's around us. Right. So yeah, just give them some ideas. And that's what inside their skill set. And that has to be the most important thing to me is because it needs to make sure everybody is going to be safe through this entire process. We don't want anyone getting hurt so they can't adventure. Right. Safe, but also authentic. Yeah. So that they're exactly. really reflecting, yeah. I guess, what they're doing. And and that's a good, a great thing because, you know, adventure is so subjective. What's adventurous to one person could be out of limits to another person. Like, you know, you can have an adventure in a city and you can have an adventure on a mountaintop and it's still an adventure. And that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. You can have adventures everywhere. It is absolutely fantastic. There's one thing in this, you know, 2020, 2021 that we're trying to have to discover is how to have adventures when we can't go super far away. You know, when we're limited to, you know, either staying locally or going places where a lot of people aren't, <laughs> you know, we have to be a bit creative in, in this time. Great. So what are some of the challenges that you face as you're doing that? Because, I mean, presumably if you're photographing somebody climbing a mountain, you're also climbing a mountain but with a camera, right? <laughs> Which is going to make it a lot harder. Yeah, it becomes a much different experience when you have like all your stuff you need to normally go up somewhere. So your extra clothes and safety gear, all that kind of stuff. And then you add, give or take 15 pounds in tripods and lenses and everything extra on top of that. Um, and so you, the weight alone just changes the experience that you're doing because you can't move fast. You can't move really all that hard either. And you're constantly looking around for different objectives so typically when you're hiking you're just kind of like oh this is pretty but mm -hmm. when you're hiking to take photos of somebody you're constantly looking for compositions you're constantly looking for places to place them what they're doing and then you're also watching them because they're your client you need to make sure they're safe and they're happy and they're enjoying themselves the entire time which adds a whole extra layer into it so you're watching to make sure they drink enough water they do all the kind of things that are going to keep them in a good mood so the photos look good you're kind of a guide as well yeah you're kind of a guide for them as well that's a great way to put it and also like I remember one point I was up hiking with somebody. I'm just like, oh, like, stop right there. And they're like, I can't. Like, it's like, why? It's like, oh, and I didn't realize that they were standing on, like, this little ledge because from oh. where I was behind <laughs> them, I couldn't see that. And they're like, oh, no, no, okay, yeah, let's keep going, right? And then, so there's this balancing act that has to take place between taking the photos but also being safe and all those kind of things. So, yeah, there's a number of challenges you wouldn't think of necessarily. You know, and you, you were talking about weight, and I do a lot of – camping and I've done a lot of backpack camping in the past. And that's a world where every ounce counts, you know, every, every piece of gear you're, you're trying to decide between a little stove and another little stove. And the difference could be so minuscule, but it, it matters, especially if you're out there for any amount of time. So like you said, carrying around 15 pounds of gear makes you really probably have to think a lot harder about what else you're bringing with you, right? What else is actually necessary when you're out there? That's interesting. Yeah. I got this hilarious story that was, um, I was hiking into Elk Lakes, uh, which is this beautiful place up in um, Kananaskis country, you know, or in, I guess it's in BC. You start in Alberta, head to BC. Um, and it is fantastic. It's about 12 to 13 kilometers to get into, not bad. And we're going along and just playing one of those games you do when you just need to get to an area and just not focus on the hiking, right? And so my friends ask, like, oh, we love this game. Like, tell us the one useless thing you always bring with you backpacking. And she was talking about, she always brings along, like, in huts to some like something to bake basically like cookies or brownies or something like that to make in there my brother-in-law brings along I forget exactly what it was but something like that and they look they both look at me he's like Robert what about you and I like look down and I have this camera hanging <laughs> off my I'm like here this this five pound thing sitting right. on here <laughs> um, but that's that's I love doing it I love having it so of course it's gonna be there with me and if it's your passion it's it's something that would be necessary for what you're doing because yep, that's what you care exactly. about and that's really cool so I mean, what kind of gear do you use? What is your camera setup like when you're going out to do some adventure photography? If it's an easier hike, I will bring along. So I have a Canon EOS R. Um, eventually I'll get the R5, but I'll get, I nice. have the R for now. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I typically take a 70 to 200 to 8. And that's okay. for anything that's longer away, portraits, things like that, and any compressed landscape. So 200 mil, anything 100 to 200 mils creates really nice compression on landscapes. Um, and then I'll take along a 16 to 35 F4. Um, purely that's for weight savings. I don't find I need the 2.8 on the, um, on my two, on my six, ugh, 16 to 35. Oh, I can talk this morning. I apologize. That's right. um, <laughs> that's I didn't right. need the 2.8 as much as the F4 does because I shoot using a wide angle to get a lot of depth of field. So I don't need to go down as far as 2.8 ever. Um, and then if I'm really going to go somewhere light and easy, I'll bring along like a small 50 mil 1.2, 1.4, something like that, just so I can take some portraits, have some really blurred background. Um, and then 
on trips where I know I'm going to go look for wildlife, I'll either bring a tele-extender along, so a two times tele-extender to make that 70 to 200, uh, 140 to 400, or I'll bring a 100 to 500 mil. Yeah, it really depends on the adventure, but like if it's a light, easy expedition where we're not too worried about our safety or needing extra gear or anything, I bring along a lot of extra kit. And then as that adventure gets more difficult, I start paring back on what's going in there. So like I went on a trip uh, this past weekend knowing that the weather might be okay, might not, right? Like it was good. It was, mm-hmm. I wasn't anticipating taking photos. I was just going out for a fun day in the mountains. So I actually yeah. left my gear at home because we didn't know really what we were getting into. So I just brought my camera with some, or my phone with some like little polarizers okay, for yeah. it and stuff like that. Man, well, that, that makes me so nervous. I'm always so nervous about my gear. I mean, just even just walking around about my lens and, and whatnot, like, how do you keep it safe? How do you like protect all your gear? Or do you just <laughs> not worry about it and just trust that it's going to be okay? Like photography gear is not cheap. Like, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an expensive little thing to get into for sure. If you're carrying around like a little Canon Rebel or like one of the lower yeah. end SLRs, be gentle with them. They break easily. Um, okay. They're still an SLR, so they're, but they're plastic, right? They're things like that. If you've got something like an EOS R or a Canon 6D Mark II or any of the mirrorless system mm-hmm. setups that are going out there now, they're full metal bodies. They're full fine. They're typically really well weather sealed. You okay. can trash that thing. So like um, I used to carry around a 50D actually when I was a journalist and that mm-hmm. thing took literal hockey pucks off of it, sticks, um, wow. everything, anything you can think of it. And it ran just fine and it still shoots just fine. Um, so they're durable little beasts. You can be totally fine with them. Obviously you want to be gentle with them as much as you can, but don't be overly paranoid about putting them into dangerous and difficult situations because they're built for it. Have a F-stop gear 50 liter backpack. Um, which is camera photography specific. And then it has what's called an internal camera unit that goes into it. So typically a photography backpack will have space for all the gear inside and nothing else. But the F-Stop Gear, Shimoda Designs, they both create backpacks that have an internal camera unit that you can then specialize sizes on. So like I have one that's called a medium camera unit and it basically takes up half the backpack. So I can use half the backpack for my camera equipment and it's all sealed on the sides, all foam. It's all protected really, really well. And then I can put other gear on top, which in the mountains is super necessary. So cool. So that yeah, that's something that I get I get really nervous about. I mean, I have an old old camera, but I'm still like <laughs> I keep it just walking around. I maybe I maybe I just need to trust it more. Yeah, if you're using ones that are are well constructed, you can trust them to do anything. Like I've been in rainstorms. I've taken like I wander in blizzards constantly with my camera, and it's fine. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a little bit more intense than anything we get here. Here we just get rain. <laughs> The rain can be pretty bad there. It's awful at times, but um, <laughs> it doesn't last so long. So you can just hide from it when it's time. Uh, what is your favorite photograph that you've ever taken? And what was the story behind it? Oh, Either your favorite photograph or your favorite photograph story. Yeah, I think I, my favorite photograph story is actually one of the funnier ones that's happened. It's not my favorite photo by any stretch. It's a pretty mediocre photo uh-huh. now, but it was back when I first started taking photographs back in like 2010 kind of t- range. And I was actually in Scotland with my family visiting oh, cool. the extended family that lives over there. Um, and my brother-in-law was with us and hanging out and um, we're, we're sitting in a lock and he's kayaking in the lock at sunset and we're taking photos and it's beautiful. And there's this light beam coming straight through these two hills that are connecting. It's like, this is stunning. And I've set up my tripod and he's in the lock and I'm yelling at him to like, go over, go left, go right. Just a little bit, like to try and get him in the sunbeam. And then he stops and he's like super close, but I can't quite get in the lineup. And he's like, turns around and yells at me, just move your fucking camera. <laughs> like, oh yeah. And I just like shifted my camera over like maybe six inches to get in there. It's like, <laughs> Right. Yeah, of course. I, I can yeah, do I can that. Too, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it was this is like, oh, yeah. And so I have this photo and it's not great, but I have it on my business cards as like one of the images people can choose because I love telling the story because it's like, yeah, I make dumb choices all the time, too, when I'm taking images. So yeah, I remember and it's just such a happy moment for me. But I think one of my favorite photos I've ever taken um, actually goes back to when I was a journalist in High River. Um, and I was actually taking photos at the rodeo down there. I, I loved shooting rodeo. It's a huge part of Alberta's culture. It's a huge part of right, town yeah. culture, especially. Um, and so I've been to a huge number of them as a journalist, and they're amazing. The people are amazing. Just everything about them is spectacular. And so because I had a press pass, I actually got to hang out on the shoots, which is where the animals and all the competitors come out of. Um, and I got to get to know the guys really well and get to chat with them. And there was one day where they were debating if the rodeo was going to go because it was so muddy and so Mm -hmm. rainy and just like the weather was nasty and then the sun broke out and because they're cowboys they're like well okay 
this is great. It's not unsafe for our animals anymore. So let's go. Like they didn't, they don't care about themselves. They care if their animals are going to be safe. Um, And so they were like, let's do this thing. It's awesome. It's not unsafe for them anymore. And there's this uh, picture I have, and it's been in the Calgary Stampede Western Art Show, and it's been published a few times over. And it's of a steer wrestler who's just jumped off his horse, and he's just grabbed the steer, and he's just starting to take it down, but it's before all the mud has hit him. So he's still nice and blue, and like his blue jeans are blue, his shirt's blue, and then there's just this huge spray of mud, and you can just see the anticipation of it just about to slam right, down on top. Right, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, I, I love that so much. And I love it because of that story of like, I know the guy. I talked with him afterwards. Like he was laughing his head off about being covered in mud, right? So it was a good time. The best photographs are the ones that tell a story, right? Yeah, most definitely. But how do you tell a story when it's just nature? So if you don't have a person in the shot, how do you how do you tell a story? Um, so you really want to walk through an area and get to know it a lot. Uh-huh. I find a lot of people will go to a spot and then just like set up their cameras or shooting. So like Lake Louise, super famous position here in Alberta. Um, there's this beautiful spot in the area where it's like right at the edge and the lake forms into the middle and everyone knows that photo. If you look up Lake Louise, you'll find it instantly. And I find a lot of people will just go there, stop, take that photo, and then that's it. They'll put their camera away or they'll walk away. They'll go back through their car. And it's, no, no, you don't know. You don't know the area of Lake Louise at all by doing that. There's trails off everywhere. There's It's an amazing spot. So you need to, if you really want to tell a story of an area, tell a story of a landscape, you need to get there early, like hours before the light is going to change to be the proper spot and walk and explore and get down low and climb up as high as you possibly can get to and get to know that area as best as you can. And you'll find the bits that feel right about it. And that's what's really important is exploring an area because it will it will speak to you, almost literally will speak to you about like, this is who I am. And it's typically not the tourist spot. It's typically going to be hidden off two hours away, tucked in a corner. So walk and explore. That's the best way to do it. Totally get that. I mean, even here in Bangkok, I'll, I'll take a picture. I have a million pictures of the famous sites from the, sa- the famous angles. But my favorite pictures are the ones that are just from a different perspective, you know, from, from another alleyway or something that you don't normally see. Um, because it Because it is different, because it tells a different story. And I think that's really really great advice you know and photography is a patience game a lot of the times i think especially when you're outside you know you have to deal with light and and weather and all sorts of things and i think that's really important very cool well the situation might not be perfect for the lighting at that point i don't know how many times i have gone back to vermilion lakes which is the typical viewpoint of mount rundle and banff um, at the banff town site itself i've been there 20 times in my life probably to shoot mm. things and i finally just got like the perfect sunrise really? a wow. little while ago and it's like yes this is finally happening but you have to keep going back to try and get it and truly is a patient game. patience game i love that you said that that's perfect yeah wow that shows the dedication that you have to have i guess if you really really have an image in your mind you know what you want to get you just have to wait <laughs> yep, that's it every photographer has to put themselves kind of in strange situations at some point and maybe you have more of these stories i don't know from your journalism experience but what has been the most embarrassing or even dangerous experience that you've had when trying to capture that perfect moment that you wanted to capture do you have any crazy (laughs) stories about trouble getting into trouble (laughs) while trying to get get the perfect shot (laughs) yeah there's a few of them so there was one um I'll, I'll, here, I'll do these in like quasi chronological order because like, so we'll go back to journalism to begin with, just because I, I love this story and it's one of my favorites. Um, shooting those rodeos, I would also go stand on the fences and take them. And we was watching some bull riding out in High River and it's bull riding under the light. So it's dark and all that kind of stuff with just these huge floodlights on. Guy comes out of the chute, falls off the bull in maybe a second, like it was a short ride. Mm. And so I'm taking some photos of him as he's dejected and like just lost this competition. And it taught me a great lesson at this point because I was only pay att- paying attention to the cowboy and not to what the bull had done. Um, and the bull had walked away and gone out of my field of vision off to my right. And I'm watching this guy and I see this little bit of motion out of my right, eye, out of the right of my eye. And I look over and there's this bull and it's staring straight at me as I'm standing on the fence, leaning over the fence, taking photos. And then it starts pawing the ground. I'm like, Oh, that's not good. And it charged the fence. Um, and like, you know, six inch horns or something like that. Yeah, and as I jumped yeah. off the fence, this bull's head slams into it and its horns come oh, through gosh. right where I'd been standing. And they like, I curved my belly away and the horns, I feel like they were millimeters. They weren't, they were probably more like centimeters or an inch <laughs> right. away, but in my brain, they're much, much closer. Uh, but yeah, like I remember this bull slamming into the fence and landing and then it hit the fence a few more times as it's running me. I'm like, Oh, wow. Oops. That right. Could have been really with bad, two eyes. Right. That could have been really bad. Yeah. And a couple of the cowboys come over and know me and they're just like, dude, you've got to be more careful. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, I really, 
Yeah. So that was That's a, really scary. Yeah. That was a pretty good reminder to shoot with two eyes open, especially so if you're somewhere where there's a lot of activity, a lot of cars, a lot of people, animals, whatever, a lot of people will close one eye when they're taking photos. You really need to shoot with two eyes and learn how to do that. That's really good advice. So I'm, I'm from Texas and I've done a lot of hiking in Texas and Colorado, New Mexico and that area. It's wild. You know, I think that a lot of people who come to the US, Canada, North America, they don't realize how wild the nature is and how dangerous it can be. I mean, even if you're at a very famous national park, you know, people oh, yeah. get killed at Yellowstone. People get killed by buffalo, bison. They don't think that they're dangerous, right? You You have to watch out for these things. I mean, when you're in the woods, especially if you're by yourself, I mean, if oh, an elk yeah. comes or a, or a bison or a bear, I mean, I think that's a really good lesson for people that are going to actually be outside taking photographs. Yeah, you got to be super aware of everything. So like I was out shooting at um, in Canmore the other day and where I wanted to get to was blocked by a herd of elk. And I watched so many tourists try to walk through a herd of elk, and I'm like, they're I, dangerous. There's no, yeah, they're very dangerous. There's not a hope I would try to walk through a herd. No, just because they don't eat meat doesn't mean that they can't. Like they're huge animals. <laughs> they're not going to eat you, but they could kill you, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So let's see here. What's the other story I was going to tell? It just slipped out of my mind here. Oh right. So a few years ago, my brother-in-law and I, like, he is the one you will. If you talk to me a lot about hiking, he is the one I will reference constantly because he's the reason I got into it and I love it dearly. Um, and so we were out doing a winter hike actually up a place called Heart Mountain and it's a scrambler's mountain here in just about an hour outside Calgary. And it's not too bad. It's about two and a half hours to do. It's only maybe 800, 900 meters of elevation gain. Mm -hmm. So a pretty straightforward hike in the winter that changes quite drastically because there's a lot more snow on the roads, a lot slipperier. It's a lot harder to see where you're going, what you're doing. Um, and we're headed up there and then the wind kicked up really bad, which turned the entire thing into a huge whiteout. And so we couldn't really see, we were headed up there to take some photos at night and to do some like star photography and just to enjoy a good night. Yeah. Cause like you can start hiking in the dark at like four 30 here in winter. So you really can, <laughs> right. you, you're not out that late to go do these things. Um, and so we're going heading up there and we're maybe a third of the way up the route, halfway up the route. And we stop and like our, my other brother-in-law is behind us a little ways and he's yelling up at us going like, Hey, should we keep going? And Rob and I stop and we're looking at each other. We're like, huh, should we, should we not? And then like, the wind dies down for a second and so we can mm -hmm. see again more than like two feet in front of our faces and there is my foot like a foot away from a cliff edge and so we had gone we we should not have been near this cliff edge the route actually takes you off to the left and keeps you in the middle of the mountain um wow. so we went totally off route had not realized it because of the snowstorm um wow. I, was like, I am i am a foot away from falling off the edge oh, of man, this that's thing. crazy and he was sitting on a tree that literally bent out over the edge oh, without realizing like we were just like yeah it's time to go home like the, this is time right. to go home now. <laughs> so we turned around and just like went sideways off the edge of the mountain, like to get into the middle and further away from the cliff edge and then went straight down. That's really um, scary. Yeah. You had to be, that was, that was the worst moment I think we've had on there. And that was the, the defining moment of being like, you know, in your mid twenties being like, I can do anything. I can't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Better to learn it that way. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. That could have ended very badly. And I'm so glad that that didn't. I think that's really a, a really important takeaway is that being outdoors in nature is so much fun and it's such a valuable experience, but you do have to be careful. Yeah. I talk about it a lot and I know I, I say it a lot on the podcast, but that's, that's one of my big things is like, there's a guy here in Calgary called by the name of Will Gadd and he is one of the greatest ice climbers in the world. Yeah. Um, he's one of the only people who has ever climbed Niagara Falls. He is one of the only people who, he invented spray climbing. Um, which is literally climbing the ice that comes off of a waterfall. When the waterfall flows too fast to freeze, wow. he climbs the ice behind it. Yeah, he is he is an That's amazing crazy. dude. Check him out if you ever get the chance. Will Gadd is amazing. Um, but I went to a talk by him, and he sat there with, like, and he's like, yeah, I fail at 80% of the objectives I do because it's unsafe. This is one of, if not the greatest ice climber in the world, flat out saying, I fail 80% of my objectives because I want to get home and be able to do it again. Know your surroundings. And don't be afraid of them, though right? Like, like know your surroundings and be prepared for them. But I hear too many people who come to the city and be like, I don't want to go out to wherever because there's bears or there's cougars or oh, yeah. they, they're going to leave you alone for the most part. Like don't be prepared and know, but go and enjoy and have fun and experience it all. Like don't let it stop you, but just be prepared for it. Exactly. Like with the cougars, yeah, they're very dangerous, but I've heard way more stories of people who got home and they were looking at their cameras and they saw like a cougar in their pictures then I have heard stories of people actually getting attacked by them. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> they don't want to, they don't want to deal with you. No, unless you 
just stumble across them and surprise them, really. Yeah, exactly. So what, I guess what is some of the advice that you would give to somebody who wants to kind of get into outdoor photography or just travel photography, adventure photography in general? It doesn't necessarily have to be adventure photography, but like what if somebody wants to start developing their photography skills? Uh, for a beginner, I would start off by telling them you don't need a fancy camera by any stretch of the imagination. Photography isn't created on equipment. It's created by what you can see and how you can see and create and tell that story. Um, so like having a big camera and fancy lenses and all that is great and it enhances the ability, but it's not going to do you any good if you don't know the fundamentals of photography to begin with. Um, so you really need to start understanding what the exposure triangle is, which is your ISO, your shutter speed, and your f-stop. Right, there are the basics of exposure and all that kind of stuff that you need to know to create a proper image. And then you also really need to focus on composition. Composition trumps everything. You could have a grainy image, you could have an underexposed image, all these kind of things. And if you have the right composition, it trumps anything else that's going on in that image. So really take your time to learn about composition, learn from the masters. A lot of photography is literally stolen from painting. A lot of our mm. compositions, a lot of things like that. So go back and learn from like, Van Gogh, learn from like, I always go to the Canadian seven. There's like these seven landscape photographers and they're amazing. Go learn from your favorite painters and look at how they composed images and look at how they did things. We literally have um, Rembrandt lighting in photography. There's a style of lighting called Rembrandt lighting. Really interesting. And it copies exactly how he lit his portraits in his paintings. Interesting. So I, that was my, one of my other biggest things is to go and learn from the masters of painting and go and learn from masters of photography and just go look at, go look at photographers who you like. They don't even necessarily have to be famous because there's a lot of famous photographers who I don't really care for. But mm. if you find someone you really love, look at their images and figure out what it is about them that you love. Why do you like this? What is it about them? Like, I would fully suggest people start with somebody like Paul Ziska, who's this BAM photographer here who does Aurora work, but he combines Aurora with like people and all these beautiful and amazing compositions. And so look at those kind of photos and see what you love about them. And that will take you so much further on photography than spending $20,000 on gear. Um, I can outshoot people with my iPhone yeah. than like somebody shooting on an R5 who has no idea what they're doing. Great. I think that's very encouraging. So first, I, I do kind of want to ask about the Aurora photography because that sounds really interesting. I've heard that the Aurora is really kind of notoriously difficult to photograph. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you have any stories about that? Because that sounds super cool. Yeah. So uh, Aurora photography, night photography, all that is notoriously difficult. It is a totally different art form than shooting in the middle of the day so to get to get started with it let's say that you're interested in doing it you can do it on an iphone you can do it on any flagship really? phone at this point yeah you can you just have to change some of the night mode settings i'm not going to go into that here because it'll depend on the phone that you have um, but dig into it you will however need a tripod and some way to mount your phone to a tripod because you can't have any movement in that camera because you're going to ex be exposing for seconds at a time and you will shake we are human beings we move constantly um, and so you, anytime you're shooting at any sort of extended shutter speed, you need to have your camera stabilized as best you can. I would always suggest a tripod for that. You can use a car, a fence post, anything, but tripods work the best for it. Um, and then if you're going to take a step up from using an iPhone or using a flagship phone, I would fully suggest getting a wide angle, really fast lens. So you're looking at mm -hmm. something like a 14 millimeter 2.8. So 14 millimeters is the focal length that you'll be looking at. 14 means super wide. That is way beyond the human vision of what we would normally see. And 2.8 is your f-stop. And that just means that the aperture on the lens opens really wide, which allows a lot of light to get in and hit your sensor. So the wider that aperture goes, the better it is for night photography. And that would be the start of like, if you're interested in starting doing it, the last thing would be is to understand your infinity focusing. Um, because the stars, the aurora, everything happens outside of infinity on a lens. So typically lenses focus, you know, up to 10, 14, 15 feet in front of them. And then they hit infinity. And then everything from that point and beyond is going to be in focus. Um, and so you just want to understand how your infinity focus works on your lens. Um, and that takes a little bit of finagling because every lens has a little marker on it that says like, this is infinity. But every lens also has a little bit of play in and around that because they're, they're machines, right? They aren't sure, perfect yeah. tolerances. And so you're going to have to figure out where infinity actually is on your lens and where it's actually in focus and then mark it for yourself. Um, so like I, my 16 to 35 is actually not quite in focus when it sits on its infinity mark. I have to move it ever so slightly off of it just to get it perfectly in focus. And that is probably the biggest thing in Aurora photography that is nearly impossible to get done right. Um, because there's no lights, there's no way to really autofocus it to tell it to be on there. And you have to be really careful with focusing it into infinity for yourself. So 
Cool. From what I understand, it's very um, elusive as well, isn't it? Like I know that there's a like a forecast, but I've heard stories of people that have gone to Norway or something, and they said, "Yeah, we were out there for ten days, and and we never saw it." Like, how do you 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 just have to kind of get lucky, I suppose, right? Oh, hugely, yeah, luck, and then being ready. So, like, aurora chasing has become this huge thing in Alberta during the pandemic because we can't travel, we can't go anywhere, so people are looking yeah. for things to do outdoors. You can do it outside, you can do it safely. All the kind of mm. things that we need right now. So, the group that I'm actually a part of has people on there. They're like, "Here is, I think, believe it's space weather." Dot com, I believe is the name of the website that they use. And it's a forecasting site that doesn't actually forecast if the aurora is going to hit necessarily. It forecasts what the sun is doing because the aurora is created by solar flares coming off the sun and hitting the magnetic, The I believe it's the magnetic bit of our atmosphere. Don't quote me on that though. I don't remember the science I behind think that's it. Right. I think... <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, sh- I yeah. shoot it. I don't want to remember the science behind it. It's kind of green. It looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So like, we can go through waves where like last year there was almost no aurora in Alberta. Like mm-hmm. it just, there was not a good season for it this year. It's been like every weekend there's been something going on. So we go through cool. a lot of, ch- and it's, it just purely happens with the sun shooting solar flares out at us and seeing yeah. what happens. So you got to pay attention for that. There are times of year where it's more likely to be seen. Um, so like you don't want, you can go to the, like the North of Canada, but during the summer they have permanent sunlight at certain points. So you won't see the aurora. You can't see the aurora over top of the sun. It's too bright. Um, but if you go there and say like when it's pitch dark all the time, like it's 24 hours of darkness, you yeah. have a much higher chance of seeing the aurora because you could see it at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's not purely a night thing. It's it's just whenever the sky is dark enough to see it. So plan your trip accordingly. Um, look at the look at the timing and the weather if you want to see the aurora. And then there are certain times of the year where it's slightly more likely to happen just because the earth is tilted in the right direction at the sun and all those kind of little factors. So you can find out typically here. March is one of the best times to see the aurora. Um, beginning of April kind of range, we're at the exact right tilt to the sun, and the sun typically shoots a lot of solar flares, and it's dark enough, early enough, all those kind of factors come into play. So That is so cool. Man, oh, yeah, yeah I'd amazing. love to see that. That's that's like a bucket list thing, I think. Oh, yeah. it's If anyone can see it, it is spectacular. There is a southern version as well. So if you're, if you're in the Australia area, if you're in the tip of um, Chile and Argentina, you can actually see the um, Southern Aurora, which I totally forget the name of now. I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the exact same phenomenon. Typically, it's a little like pinker than the oh, Northern Aurora is. That's cool. But yeah, it's there. And it's, it's not as popular because it's not as populated. It's a lot harder to see the Southern one unless you're on Antarctica. Oh, that's really cool, though. Man, yeah, I'd love to see that. Oh, yeah, so would I. Well, from uh, some of the things you've mentioned, I kind of think I have an idea about your opinion on this, but what are your thoughts on mobile photography? I think it's fabulous. I just documented my last hike with an iPhone because I didn't want to bring my big camera with me. I think it's brilliant. The best thing that photography does is not, like, I love the equipment. I'm a gearhead through and through, but the best thing about photography is the stories it can tell and what you can show the world that's going on around you. So mobile photography is amazing. I absolutely adore it. And I love that it has opened up photography to so many other people to have an appreciation of it, put more art into the world. That's to be one of the biggest things for me is there's more art being created by people in the world and there's more stories being told. Yeah. And it's just such a huge thing for me to have people creating art and creating beauty and adding that back to us. So yeah, mobile photography is great. Don't feel bad for doing it. If that's all you want to do, do mobile photography. It's amazing. It's light. It's easy. Oh, it's so much better than carrying a big camera, to be totally honest. Uh, Do you have any apps that you would recommend? Yeah, so I really love, um, I use Lightroom on my phone for editing. Um, So I have a Lightroom account. So if you use Adobe, use the Lightroom phone app, but don't use the camera on there. I I know you can shoot in RAW with it, but it's terrible and it takes a long time to load. Um, There's a, oh, Halide, Halide, it's like H-A-L-I-D-I-E, I believe. Uh, It is brilliant. It's got a really interesting interface that works really, really quickly. The one thing I wish iPhone would let you do, I love my iPhone, it's super stable, but I wish that they would let you change the camera, the default camera app for when Mm. you swipe right on the screen. That's one of the biggest pet peeves I have because I will just, something's happening and I'll just use the the camera app that's built in and it works fine, it's okay. Right. Yeah, but Halide is brilliant and spectacular. It works really well. They have a long exposure section in there. You have to add on purchases, of course, but um, but you can do, that's how you do night photography is with these extra long exposure pieces they put in and you can do proper like, um, light trail photography and light writing photography with it. You can do pretty much any type of photography you're interested in with this app and it is brilliant and it works really, really well. I think it's super cool that everybody carries a pretty decent camera with them nowadays. 
Uh, and, and they just get better and better. I was looking back, even some of the pictures I took on my camera or my phone camera, you know, five or six years ago um, here in Thailand wasn't that great. The pictures I take now, and this is not even like a, a brand new model iPhone, they're so great. Mm -hmm. When I started doing mobile photography a little bit was when I was a journalist because you need to yeah. have something with you all the time. Right, um, sure. It was with an iPhone 4. And honestly, that quality was so bad. I never ran anything unless I desperately had to. Um, like if I was, if that was the only choice I had, I would put something from it, but otherwise I wouldn't. So even two or three years ago, I wouldn't have necessarily said that mobile photography was something that was great, but it's come so far in leaps and bounds, especially because of computational photography. Well, there's so much demand for it. I mean, that's how they're all marketing their, I mean, any iPhone ad now, it's all about the camera. Yep. That's it. Like you, you're buying a camera yeah, really yeah. truthfully. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess let's talk a little bit about just, uh, adventure in general. So, okay, you said that you've been to Scotland. Obviously, you've done a lot of hiking in Canada. What are some of the biggest adventures that you've been on around the world? My first most memorable one is actually, a, it was a pretty short, two, like it was a weekend trip, but it was yeah. so beautiful and so full of such great people and things that like this weekend seems like it went on forever because it was so good. Um, and it was into a place called, oh, Egypt, Egypt Lakes. It was like suddenly escaped my brain, but it's into Egypt Lakes, which is this beautiful backcountry area that's actually just in behind Sunshine Village in Banff National Park. Um, and it's one of the areas you go to get into Mount Assiniboine, which is beautiful, beautiful park in BC. Um, but we stopped at Egypt Lake for about two days and there, the larches were out. So for people who don't know, larches are this type of evergreen tree that changes mm. its needle color um, in the fall. So they go from green to like this oh, beautiful yellow orange color and there's whole valleys of them and they just the, the whole place looks like it's on fire it is beautiful and amazing um so yeah you walk through like large valley you go up over these hills and you walk into this area that's totally untouched and there's like a couple camping sites and a shelter to stay in and that's it there's no other people around there's no other anything and it is quiet and beautiful and it's just one of the most amazing places in the world and so i remember this because we left after work on a friday got in at like nine ten o'clock at night into this shelter we hiked half the way in the dark like we smelt like beer coming in because my brother-in-law slipped <laughs> while we were walking down like we were coming down and he slipped and punctured one of his beer cans <laughs> so we walk into the shelter at like 10 o'clock at night smelling like beer and just everyone's like well, what are these people doing here <laughs> it's like oh no here's the drunk louts who are coming in it's like no no and so yeah yeah and it was a great a great introduction to the people you're going to spend the weekend with right sure yeah yeah um, great first impression and then we spent the weekend just hanging out with people and hiking and exploring one of the most beautiful places on the planet so yeah that stands out because of the people in it. and it i guess as, as you listen to the stories i tell almost everything comes back to the people and the places that you and the people that you meet there because that's really what it's all about for me it's about stories. traveling and adventuring exactly it's the stories and it's the people and it's the interactions the images are amazing in the end but the images are amazing not necessarily because of where you are but because of the people that you're with and the energy that mm -hmm. you give to them Right. So, yeah, so that, that's, that it's not a crazy story, but I love it because of that human interaction that's in there. Sure. Yeah. And then what are the other, we've got a big uh, trip planned. We had one, it was supposed to be this past August, unfortunately, but obviously no travel was happening. Um, uh, we were going to go do the Isla Sky Trail, which is like bucket list item for me to go and do. Uh, the Isla that's Sky cool. is amazing. I want to go back there so bad and you can hike across the entire Island. It takes about eight days to do. And that would be, that, that's top of my bucket list. So yeah, that'll probably be my favorite adventure when I get to it. But yeah, man, we might have to have you back on to talk about that when you finally do that, because I would love oh, to hear love about that. that. Yeah, well, yeah, unfortunately, I think a lot of our plans got derailed last year, but at least you live somewhere where you can still get out and and see the nature anyway. Yeah, which and is, be out which is still... an adventure. And... I, I completely agree about the human interaction here in Southeast Asia. I'm traveling around places where, of course, I don't speak the language, but you know, emotions are universal and capturing a picture and capturing a moment. It's universal. That beautiful human moment that you can get with somebody else. I think that's really what makes travel important. Oh, a hundred percent. That's, that's what makes travel so, so good in our worlds. I feel like I'm a much, I feel like I'm a much more complete person because of the amount that I've traveled and because of the amount of yeah. people I've met all over the world. And I think everyone needs to travel a little bit more. And I think we'd be a much more connected and interconnected world if people traveled more to realize that somebody living across the ocean from you is not that different like we may speak yeah. a different language but we're all people yeah exactly yeah well isle of sky coming up hopefully soon but uh before that where's your next big adventure going to take you do you have anything planned uh, in the uh the near term 
Not anything actually planned in the near term. I've actually taken on a new position, so I'll be running content for the Banff uh, Lake Louise Tourism Board. Oh, very cool. Um, so that's that's what's causing my move out to Banff. Right. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, it's huge. I'm. It's it's a great opportunity to get out and create content in an area with amazing people and spectacular places. So yeah, I've taken on this position with them to be creating content in somewhere that I love in the world. So that's my next big adventure. That starts literally in a couple of days here. So my next big adventure is just going to be living out there and seeing what I trouble I can get myself into. That is awesome. <laughs> wow. Very cool. Well, that's super exciting. I think it's so exciting to be able to find a, find a job that allows you just to pursue your passion like that. When I got it offered to me, I'm like, I can't turn this one down. I think this is going to be too cool. Like, are they giving you like a lot of freedom in the creativity to, to do what you want to do or? Yeah, pretty good freedom in there. So like there's going to be obviously it needs to tie in with what they're doing, but they're like, you know, this area, you love this area, get out and make some cool stuff with people that ties into what we need it to. So yeah, there'll be a lot of freedom with the creativity, a lot of opportunities to travel and explore and see parts of the park that I haven't actually gotten into yet. So because I'll be living there and I'll be paid to wander around in it, then I'll just spend most of my time exploring and doing that. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. And admittedly, there's a part of me that feels really happy to help promote a part of the world that I love so much um, and to talk about part of the world that I love so much that hopefully other people will come and see and participate in when we can again. So, yeah. And quite honestly, I think that your podcast does a really good job of promoting your area as well, because I mean, your podcast, of course, it's a lot of practical tips, but it's also a lot of storytelling of the adventures that you've been on. Like the, the one that came out um, just recently about your semi-disastrous trip uh, in the snow, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, the storytelling, I think, makes this part of the world seem very appealing. And I've never been there, but I think that your podcast does a really good job of promoting the region as well. Because, I mean, that's where you are and that's where you're having your adventures. I'm glad you listened to the one on Monday. That was a semi-disaster. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that one. You know, I, I, one of my favorite quotes is that, um, you know, adventure begins when things go wrong. You know, when, when you have a perfect trip, it's great, but there's no story there. You know, what are you going to come home and say, hey, I had a great vacation. Everything was perfect. You know, that's, that's boring, right? So yeah. the good stories come from, obviously, when everything ends well, but, but when you have a good story to tell, right, when you get caught in the inclement weather. That you, that you weren't expecting. <laughs> yeah, I have a like two week trip I did through Copenhagen and Oslo and like that whole area. And uh-huh. really, there's nothing. I have some beautiful photos, but I have no stories to tell from it for that exact reason. It was like everything went off smashingly. Like, right. Yeah. Like the worst thing that happened was I bought a seventy five dollar burger that was made with Alberta beef while I was in Copenhagen. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm like great, so I'm eating the beef from my home. All right. <laughs> like so, yeah. No, I love those stories when so- something has to go a little bit sideways for things mm-hmm. to really turn really interesting. So. Right. Even if it's just rain or, or, or something, right. Something that makes it a little bit uncomfortable. Um, well, very cool. Well, let's, uh, I guess in the last couple of minutes here, let's talk a little bit about your podcast. What prompted you to start it in the first place? I really just want people to document their adventures better. I feel like there's not enough people who are creating amazing imagery from the places that they're in and really having those memories to look back on and print their own art and put it up. Cause like I have photos from my adventures hanging up on my walls here and I love, I just can just sit back and go like, Oh, that trip was cool. And I want people to be able to create that same kind of artwork that they want that piece on their wall, huge and big and like, you know, a 24 by 36 print that's pretty, Mm -hmm. but it also uh, elicits all of these emotions out of them from that trip that they were on. So that's really what brought it out in me. It was like, I want you to be able to get these beautiful images from your trips that you're going on and document your adventures better. And I think that'd be amazing. And then the other thing that came from it was that I find that there's a lot of photographers who are very closed off with their knowledge and they're very afraid because of mobile photography, because of the changes coming in the photography world. Um, and so they don't want to tell people and they want to hold on tight and they become kind of jerks about everything. And that includes like the photography groups yeah. here and things like that. And I, I hated them. I actually was not a part of a large part of them. So I wanted to set up a place that was like, let's just talk freely about this. This is an art form. Let's make art together and not right. be jerks about it to each other. So, yeah, I mean, that's honestly, that's how I discovered it. I was looking up travel photography tips and there's not that much. I mean, there's, you know, there's blog posts and things like that, but there's really not that many people sharing their expertise about it. And so I think that's why it's such a valuable resource. And I loved what you said about getting people out to kind of explore their region. People grow up in a region or they live somewhere and they don't find it interesting because they, they see it every day and it's, it, they feel that they're used to it. I mean, you know, I live here in Bangkok and there's times when I, I forget that I'm in a big, exciting, kind of exotic city. It just feels like my home. It's where I live. But 
I've kind of come to realize that when you look at your world around you through a lens, through a camera lens, it gives you that new perspective and it kind of does help you explore a little bit better. So I, I love that. I think that's awesome. You know, even if you think you live in a boring hometown, there's a way to make it interesting. Yep. There's a way to make everywhere interesting around you. It is yeah. so worth it to just walk out your front door and explore. And during times where it's a lot easier, talk to people and just say, Hey, to somebody like, you don't know what story you're going to get to see or what you're going to get to do. I've sure. gotten to do so many cool things just by saying like, Hey, how's it going? And then a conversation starts and then yeah. just kind of go where it leads you. And it's, yeah, it's beautiful. I love that. Like I, I said this at the beginning, but like the, mm. the bit about be safe while you're doing things, but don't let it stop you. Right. Like be aware, but go anyway. Like the world is, the world can seem like a scary place, but it's not really. And truthfully, if you're that little bit prepared for things, that's great. But otherwise just get out there and adventure. Don't be afraid of the bears. If you come to the mountains, don't be afraid of the cougars, things like that. Be smart around them and understand how to interact. If you see one, don't keep food in your tent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't keep food in your tent. Don't like, you know, don't go put your kid on the back of a cub, which I have seen happen. Like yeah. <laughs> there, there are things like that, but, don't be afraid of it either and get out there and explore and adventure in our world. Right. So it's so worth being out there. It's, it's good for you. You know, it's good for you. We <laughs> humans, we feel good. I think when we're out in nature, that's where yep, we're meant to 100%. be. Awesome. Well, I really enjoyed it and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Uh, where, where can our listeners find you if they want to look for you online? Obviously the podcast, the podcast, uh, it's the travel and adventure photography school. Uh, there'll be episodes coming out every Monday, kind of when we publish things. Um, yeah, they talk about like tips for photography, tips for adventuring. I think mm -hmm. the episode coming out soon will have ones on like how you buy a sleeping pad um, and things to look for for that for if you're going to be in the backcountry. Um, and it'll be sharing a lot of those kind of adventure tips That's coming really up cool, here yeah. soon. You can find me on Instagram at Robert Massey Photography and you can find the show notes, the episodes, my galleries, everything like that kind of stuff on robertmasseyphotography.ca. And those are the easiest places awesome. to get a hold of me. If you want to talk photography, send me a message. I love talking photography. And so even if you don't have an intention of listening to the podcast, drop me a line and like ask me a question about photography, things like that. Like it's really about sharing as much information about photography as possible to get as many people taking photos as possible. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed it. I would be willing to nerd out with you about photography for, <laughs> for another hour. Um, Cause so I, I. I do love it. Yeah. It's something that I'm, I'm just kind of just starting to get into really. I did take a photography class obviously in high school, like everybody. Um, but it's something that I'm just starting to get into as a hobby because I think it's a cool way to see the world and I will continue enjoying the podcast when it comes out every week. Thank you. And I appreciate you so much for having me on here. It's been so fantastic. I love geeking about photography. So thanks. This is great. <laughs> if you have another adventure where when you go on your next adventure, we would love to have you back on. You're welcome anytime. Yeah, I'd definitely love to come back on here. Thank you so much too. So we are back. So again, huge thanks to Robert for coming on the show. I had a really great time talking with him. I really appreciated him just taking the time to hang out with us. He, he's one of those people that I didn't really know much about. And it turns out I had actually seen some of his photography before just on Instagram or whatever. And when I started looking through his Instagram, I was like, oh man, I know who this guy is. He's awesome. <laughs> right. Well, because I'm sure his his photos and the places that he goes are like right up your alley. Mm -hmm. Like that's your kind of adventure, isn't it? Like hiking, backwoods, trekking, yeah, it is. you know, mountains, that kind of thing. I've never done much outdoor photography. You know, I'm living in the city. I do a lot of city photography. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. You know, it's very different. Um, it's something I'd like to try to get a little bit better at. I, I'm not a photographer by any means. I'm not good at it, really. I, I don't know anything about it. But I find it interesting the differences between like urban photography and then like wilderness photography or, or stuff like that. Because if you're in like a city, a city has life going on. It has a, not that nature doesn't, but it's it's busy. Right. Whereas if you're in nature, it's it's a different kind of feel that you're looking to get from your photo. Like if you take a picture in a city, you're looking yeah. to encapsulate, you know, movement and life and things like that. Whereas in nature, you kind of want to, at least for me, I want to capture sort of that peacefulness and just sort of 
I think I think city photography is a lot more sort of spontaneous. Mm-hmm. You know, if you see somebody doing something interesting, you have to snap that picture fast, and they're on their way. Especially like street photography. But if you're in nature, you get the chance to really set up your camera and really capture that picture that you want. You can, like you said, mm-hmm. wait for the light that you want, and you know, get the scene, get the feeling that you want to get. And I think that's really cool. I'm super impressed by him, like trekking up into the mountains with his gear, because, mm-hmm. like I said in the podcast, you know. Um, when you're backpacking, every ounce counts, and suddenly you're adding just like 15 pounds of stuff <laughs> that you may or may not use, and that takes real dedication, I think, to the craft. It does, and I mean, for me, like, I don't even like hiking with stuff. I like backpacking, I like hiking, but I don't like carrying stuff. It's annoying. We need we need porters like they have at like Mount Everest. We need like Sherpas. <laughs> just always have them. I think that's called being rich. Yeah, maybe. You just hire a guy <laughs> to carry your stuff for you. <laughs> but it was great, and um, I kind of want to go out and do maybe like a photo walk this week. Mm-hmm. And sort of work more on my technique, because technique is something I'm just not that good at. I mean, I have improved because I take photos all the time. I've been really pretty, I guess, okay about trying to document my time in Thailand over the last eight years. Yeah, yeah you have been pretty good at it. Just because it's interesting. You know, there's weird stuff going on all around me and I try to take a lot of pictures and I looked back at some of my older ones and I do notice how bad some of my pictures were like in 2013. So I think I've improved a bit, but recently I've really started trying to like consciously improve. And some of that can be blamed on, you know, equipment because like the 2013 iPhone wasn't near as good at taking pictures as the 2021 iPhone back then. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not so great. (laughs) And so it's like that kind of thing, but I do like how you said you started to see more like what you're trying to take a picture of rather than just, oh, this is neat. Snap a picture for yourself. You really want to capture Mm -hmm. what you're seeing. And that's hard when you're taking a picture, which is why I think that I am not super drawn to photography. I find it very interesting and very impressive, but I'm, I like more doing videos and things like that because for me, it's easier to capture scenery and things when there's when i have movement rather than you know a still photo however i do want to get proficient at that and i liked what he said a lot about you need to get there early and you need to explore for hours because the best shot's not going to be the spot where all the tourists go it may be beautiful but it's cliche Mm -hmm. everyone's done it you got to go from a new angle or find a different way of looking at it or a different subject sort of forces creativity and that's something Mm -hmm. i've talked about on the show that i don't really have i'm not that creative no, you and I have the same kind of mental block when it comes to creativity, I think. And it's not that mm-hmm. we're incapable of being creative. It's that it doesn't come supernaturally like it does to some people. Right. Some people have this innate ability to, you know, make art in whatever form that may be, whether it be photography, videography, mm-hmm. anything. And they can just do it. For me, for for me at least, it takes a lot of work. Like I have to I have to sit down and think about it. The fact that it took, you know how long it took us to find a name for this podcast? With the help of a generator. (laughs) And it's not even that good. (laughs) I know. (laughs) You and I, for like two weeks, were like, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll brainstorm and we'll think of names. And two weeks went by and neither of us had thought of a single thing. Yeah, our best podcast name wasn't even us. No, it wasn't. It was Anson (laughs) Mount. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, sir. (laughs) It just doesn't come supernaturally, and so I find it really impressive when people are willing to share their expertise on things, yeah. because it helps people like me experience that without having to rely on teaching myself the entire thing, which right. I, in photography, at least, like he mentioned, is a very big thing. It's very guarded and very, you know, it's, Yeah, it's a field with a lot jealous. of ego. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of ego in photography. Mm-hmm. Which is fine. You need to protect your interests and protect your art form, but at the same time, you shouldn't prevent other people from trying to get into it. Yeah. And that goes for any hobby, any expertise, anything. Don't gatekeep. It's it's not fun for anybody. If someone wants to try something, help them. I mean, it doesn't matter. People enjoy what they enjoy, and you shouldn't try and keep that from them because you think of it in a different way. Yeah, and so that's what I really appreciate about him and about his podcast is that the podcast – it's his expertise and he's sharing it freely just to get people out because he wants people to adventure. And I think that's mm-hmm. really cool. Yes. 
Robert, thank you very, very much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, I had a lot of fun, and we'd, we'd love to have you back on. It was super cool. So, guys, do check out his his website. And um, if you're in the area, yeah, uh, you should check out his adventure portrait service because I think that's a brilliant idea. You know, that way you get to have your adventure, but you still get cool pictures from it. Yeah, definitely check it out. We will link to his website, his portfolio, and the podcast in the show notes. Yeah, all right, everybody. It is time for our favorite segment, Adventures in the News. This week is Michael's turn. What do you have for us, buddy? Well, I discovered a brand new sport that actually kind of goes into what we were talking about today. Didn't really make the connection until just now. It's from, uh, yeah, it's from Sweden. It's called plogging, and it's a combination of the words jogging and the Swedish phrase plocka up, which means to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, this sport involves jogging or hiking and picking up trash as you're going. So it's a combination of exercising and keeping your area clean. And apparently their movement has grown from just Sweden to official plogging groups in more than 40 countries, all the way from Chile to India. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's very, very simple. You just you get a bag and you go hiking or whatever and jogging and you pick up trash. But I think it's brilliant and I think it's cool that they're kind of turning it into a sport or turning it into an activity because that kind of encourages people to do it. A while back, there was that kind of challenge online, the the trash bag challenge, where you would go out to a, an area and take a pic- before picture and, and clean it up and take an after picture. And people online were very cynical about it. You know, they're like, oh, you're doing this for internet likes or whatever. And I was thinking, what does it matter? You know, if, if the area is getting cleaned up, who cares if mm-hmm. it's for cynical reasons or, or whatever? I mean, it's still getting cleaned up and you're still doing it and you deserve accolades for doing so. So I think that doing something like this, creating an idea like plogging, it still gets the area clean and it gets people outside. And I just think it's nice. I think it's a cool idea. What do you think? Yeah, there's no there's no negative to it. It's exercise, it's being outside, and it's picking up trash. I mean, no matter why you do it, whether you're doing it because you think you'll get internet likes or whatever, just do it. It doesn't matter. You're picking up trash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, leave nothing but footprints. That's cool. I like that. <laughs> Pluka oop. I love like Nordic languages. They're ridiculous. I can just imagine the Swedish chef going, Pluka oop, you know, <laughs> bonking some vegetables on the head. <laughs> All righty. Well, you you got anything else, Michael? No, that's about it. On that on that note, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us. Thank you, Robert, again for the wonderful interview. I'm excited for the next time you're on, so I'll get a chance to talk to you. It's going to be great. Yep. Uh, Just a little reminder, everybody, our new monthly challenge is find your favorite spot in your area. Doesn't matter what it is. Take a picture of it and send it our way. The top three will be receiving a little prize from us. Yeah. You can find us at attemptadventure.com you can find us on instagram facebook youtube all at attempt adventure mm-hmm. email us directly at hello at attemptadventure.com or the contact us button on the website and we are officially on twitter at attempt pod yes i finally got us set up attempt adventure was too many characters so we had to go to attempt pod ladies and gentlemen thank you so much again for listening we love having you listen we love talking to you and we will see you all next week till next time keep adventuring